Okay, so let me start. Um, it's 102. I assume that mo more people is going to join us. Um, welcome everyone. I am Anna Mueller, I'm an associate professor of Polish and Polish American history at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. Um, yes, there's a message from Jamie Wright, my colleague who has been organizing this set of conversations around um, present events that historians jump in and provide some kind of historical insight and historical context. So feel free to use the chat box for typing the questions um, to Stephen, uh, our presenters, our participants. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm a historian and my colleague Jamie Wright, who's here with us as well, is a historian. So we, a couple of months ago, we decided to start inviting uh, historians, mostly from our campus, but as you can see, we're expanding, we're going beyond our campus. That makes me very happy. And we're trying to ask, uh, you know, about, um, I want to say historical, how much history scholars can actually engage and can analyze present uh, events. There's so much happening that I think we all have to think about what it means for us, for our fields, uh, but also, you know, um, something that is, of course, driving, driving this question is the question of historical context. And I am enormously grateful to Inke Hansen and Seven Siegel, who agreed to participate in this conversation and share some of their knowledge of the region in order to help us understand what's happening currently in Belarus. Unfortunately, uh, this morning we received an email from uh, Imka, who tested positive for COVID, and for that reason is uh, not able to join us. And I'm very much regret, and I think I speak not only for myself, but also for, um, you know, uh, all the uh, organizers of this event. We very much regret not being able to hear from Imka, who is a historian, but who recently has been very active in various human rights NGOs in Belarus and Ukraine. So it would be really invaluable to hear her perspective. Uh, but I think more importantly, we hope that Imka recovers soon. Imka, we're thinking about you. Uh, we wish you were here with us, but since you are not, we really hope that you will uh, get well very fast. We still have Steven Siegel with us, um, as well as um, very knowledgeable members of uh, our, uh, you know, in the audience. Um, some of them, I think, I hope will join us in this conversation. But let me start by introducing Steven Siegel. Steven is, uh, Siegel is professor of Russian, Central and East European and Eurasian history at the University of Northern Colorado. He's on leave now, teaching as a visiting lecturer at San Diego State University. He's the author most recently of amazing, absolutely wonderful book, Map Man, Transnational Lives and Deaths of Geographers in the Making of East Central Europe, published by University of Chicago Press in 2018. Uh, he's the author of uh, many other books. I will mention um, Ukrainian Under Western Eyes, um, map Mapping Europe's Borderlands, Russian Cartography in the Age of Empire, he also translated histories of destroyed Jewish settlements for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos, which have been appearing in multiple volumes since 2009. And um, more recently, and for everybody in the field, he is um, a host of incredibly important and fascinating in interviews with the authors of various books appearing uh, in the field. It's called the New Net Books Network that includes new books in Eastern European studies and new books in Russian and Eurasian studies. And it's actually amazing because he's able to record podcasts on more books than most of us are able to read. And I have no idea how he does it, but it's fantastic. And Stephen, thank you very much for this. Okay, so let's begin. We decided that we will uh, have this, uh, this uh, podcast in the form of a conversation where I will start with um, basic conversation of somebody who has been following what's happening in Belarus for the last couple of months. Um, and then we will ask our historians to provide, you know, the answers to basic questions, hoping for some kind of historical insight. Okay, and Imka is not here with us, but we decided to stick to the to the format. Uh, so let me start with the first question. 
So we know that protesters are still present on the streets of many Belarusian cities. I've been really glued to the Polish radio since Friday, um, and um, my radio is always providing, in addition to telling me what's happening in Poland, it's also providing a lot of good information about what's happening in Belarus. And I heard this morning that we've just ended 11th weekend in a row of protest in Minsk. So the protesters are calling for the recognition of the election results from August this year, in which, according to many, the oppositional candidate for the presidential seat, Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya, received the majority of the votes. And this means calling for the end of the rule of President Alexander Lukashenko, who has been the head of Belarus since 1984, and who is known as a very authoritarian leader. Stephen, do you mind telling us a little bit more about these protests? Perhaps we could start with, you know, why do Belarusian activists insist that Lukashenko lost? What evidence there is that uh, proved that the elections were rigged? And, it, and I think this is, you know, for many of us, a very important question. But more so, perhaps, what is behind these demands? Beyond a demand for a dictator to step down, the violence against, you know, the people, the protesters to stop? What do Belarusian citizens want? And what has kept pushing them to go into the streets every day for over, I think, 70 days now, close to 80 days um, at this point? Well, first of all, thank you, Anya, for the invitation. And, and I'm pleased because um, I have to fly solo a little bit, but I see so many people in the audience who I hope will ask some questions leading right up to day 78 or day 79 of the protests and, and everything that's happening right now. Um, I hope this can be a conversation. I've relied um, on the work of, I think, brilliant sociologists um, like Swavik Shirokovsky and Yelena Gapova, who is here, um, and, and others, Nelly Bekus, Sasha Razor, um, many others, not just in the Belarusian immigration, um, but on NGO work. I was an NGO myself. Um, I do have part of my family from Belarus, but I became really interested in Belarusian and Ukrainian Jewish history when I was a graduate student. And then when I translated work on Belarusian Jewish history um, for the Holocaust Memorial Museum in the United States. And, and I did this really for six years um, as part of a project on 20th century history, which, which came out to a seven volume encyclopedia of camps and ghettos, and that's still ongoing. I, my answer to the first question, which I think is a difficult question, and, and Anya asks a lot of difficult questions, is to understand history without delving too much into the context, because history is not an explanation for everything that's happening in 2020. I think we need to read it from past to present, from present to past, cross-sectionally or perhaps intersectionally incorporating race, class, gender, and why students, intellectuals, and workers are coming together at this particular contingent moment. And then maybe going into the conversation transnationally or let's say internationally, um, because in the end, at least what you have happening today, aside from a general strike, is the Coordination Council, nominally led by Svetlana, um, Tikhanovskaya, but together with a whole bunch of other people, including the Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexeyevich, and I'll get into that a little bit more. I think it's important for um, people coming in from the outside to understand a little bit of, of Belarus 101. So I, I just want to get into this without, again, saying that history provides a very, very simple answer. Um, I think it's extremely important to understand the goals of the protesters. So the most fundamental goal is Uhadi, the, the resignation of, of Alexander Lukashenko, who's been in power since 1994. And that sounds simple. If you have um, a dictator, he is a dictator, an authoritarian populist, he is an authoritarian populist. Um, having arrested and jailed 
opponents, both within parties, and then I would say in the world of informal politics, um, like Sergei Tikhanovsky, the husband of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. I, I think in order to understand the history, you need to understand a little bit about the Belarusian movement for independence. And one can certainly trace this back to the 19th century, if not before, but certainly the fundamental movements are, are 1918, um, the Belarusian Republic or the Belarusian National Republic, the two competing republics, um, and I think 1991. When you finally get Lukashenko in 1994, he was born 1954, he was the head of a collective farm. Um, he certainly dedicated himself to preserving the industrial economy of the Soviet Union in Soviet Belarus and in Minsk. I think by that point, you need to understand the conjunction of movements for democracy. One of the things that's interesting to me about Lukashenko is the extent to which he prevented, not in his defense, but prevented oligarchical capitalism and, and a form of liberal democracy. There are many on the left who are wondering to what extent they should, um, they should support this Belarusian movement in 2020. Um, I love Professor Gapova's analogy. She's talked about this as a choice between the toad, the toad and the snake. Um, the choice between Lukashenko, the dictator, and the, opposite, and the opposition, the oppositia. I, th I think this is an interesting moment to get us forward from 1994 through the six elections up to the events of May and June of 2020. Um, I would describe the protests as follows, just as, as a way of initiating the conversation. So there are leading characters on the stage in this drama. Um, these people are by name, of course, um, Lukashenko, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya or Tsikhanovskaya, um, Sergei Tikhanovsky, who, who is the founder of a very influential YouTube channel and blog. Um, Tikhanovskaya is interesting because while the regime has described her as a woman and a housewife in all of that misogynist language, she was a translator and an English teacher. Um, she is 38 years old. Uh, and has some experience traveling out of Belarus and is certainly capable more than United States presidents of being the leader, to my estimation, of this country. Um, there are other figures who um, I think, as Nelly Beckus and other um, scholars have pointed out, have their own vision or their own version of what um, Belarus looks like or what perhaps Belarus can be. Um, these are alternative Belaruses, I think, in the plural, behind the singularity of the protest movement. So, um, for example, in addition to the blogger and activist, um, Sergei Tikhanovsky was jailed in May. Um, you have Viktor Babariko, who was um, jailed in June, and Valery Tsepkalo, um, who was denied re his registration to be able to run as a political candidate, again, on trumped up grounds. Um, all sorts of things uh, there in May and, and June. Um, Lukashenko consistently has described himself um, as the only candidate. He claimed 80% of the vote, uh, which is absolutely preposterous. Um, I think more likely, at least judging from the recent studies and polls, one came out a few days ago from Chatham House, and I can provide the link to that if you're interested. Most likely, I think we're talking about um, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya having won between 60 and maybe 75 percent of the vote. Uh, the, Chatham Post, uh, the, the Chatham House poll puts it at about 52 percent, but it's a sample of of only maybe 900 people, a cross section of the Belarusian population. Um, to answer this question further, you have segments of the population who are represented by different um, oppositional candidates. So 
Maria Kolesnikova and Veronika Tsepkolo. Um, Kolesnikova, who worked with and for Viktor Babariko in the high-tech sort of vision of what Belarus should be. For those of us who are here on the West Coast, um, it's absolutely true that Belarusians are, are, are interest in, interested in and influential um, in the tech economy. This is something I think which we could also talk about because so much significant journalism has come out. Um, the head of the sort of international or foreign or diplomatic department for Tikhonovskaya is um, Franak Vyachorka, who is um, extraordinarily talented, I think, um, in, in getting this new media out with other journalists um, like uh, Hanna Lyubakova and I would say Tadeusz Girchan and Shirakovsky and others. Many of these journalists are Belarusians. Many of these journalists have, I think, the shared common goals of democracy and civil society and human rights. This is a long story, but I think to kind of wrap it up, the common goal of the protests, including so many women that you see, is really an end to political repression and violence. Um, again, I think Professor Gapova can correct me, but we're talking about between maybe 7,000 and 13,000 arrests. Um, and that's extremely significant. It might even be higher. We don't know because there are constant beatings, violence, um, detentions, people sent into the Akrestina prison or into Jodino. Um, you know, I mean, Felix Ackerman it has um, his contacts in Grodno. He's, he's also a leading German historian of Belarus together with Anika Valka. I, I mean, once we get out to Gomel and outside of Minsk and into the small towns, seeing the protests happen day by day by day, there may even be more arrests that we don't know about. Poets are being arrested. Dmitry Strosev was, was detained. Um, extraordinarily brilliant and talented poet. So if there is a common goal to the protests at this point, it is Uhadi, Lukashenko out. The question of course is then what next after the political violence is, is stemmed. So maybe five goals, the resignation of Lukashenko, the call for a free and fair election, meaning either Tikhanovskaya is declared the winner or the lighter um, solution would be for the EU and the US and for others, nominal democracies to support a re-election, to support a free and fair election beyond this preposterous idea that Lukashenko won 80% to her 10% or 10.1%. The release of political prisoners um, which I, I think is almost a consensus among the opposition as among the working population, um, an ending of police brutality. But of course, this means different things to different people. If you're a worker participating in protests, chances are you might be working for one of the state-led industries. We're talking about a country with a population about the size of Sweden or Hungary, 10 million people in which 45% of the population roughly are working for one of the state industries. Um, and as a result of that with tractor factory or the manufacturing of potash or the export of goods into the Russian economy, many of those who are protesting are not making the choice, let's say that Ukrainians made of a liberal orientation during the Euromaidan in 2013-14, where they were calling the revolution a revolution of dignity and waving European flags or EU flags and calling for extensive integration within the European Union. I think this is absolutely fascinating because if you pull the Belarusian protest movement, if you can call it a movement, it seems much more spontaneous. You know, listening to Viktor Tsoi songs, most of the people I would say in the protest movement do not want to disjoin the Belarusian economy from the Russian economy or the Eurasian Union economy or whatever you might want to call it. So this is a very delicate, I would say, balancing act for um, the supporters who are the elites. Now, 
going to Berlin or fleeing the country or trying to avoid detention. Um, and I think that's a conversation that we that we can have. Uh, Anya, if you want, I can talk about the August events or um, let's go to the other questions. Uh, well, I feel like this, the, the other questions are very much related. Um, especially that, um, and, and this is, I think, a conversation that we've seen in a uh, conversation ab about many of the uh, protests that we've seen recently all over the world, including, you know, Black Lives Matter protests, uh, meaning the organization of those protests and the leaders behind them, right? It has been right. emphasized over and over again that this particular one is very peaceful. And I will quote Slavik Sierakowski here, who was already uh, mentioned a couple of a couple of times. Slavik Sierakowski is a sociologist and an activist from Poland who has been in Belarus for, actually, I'm not sure whether he's still there, but he was there for a while documenting what's happening for Polish, but also Western audience. And at some point he wrote, there have been no broken windows, no rioting, no Molotov cocktails. Belarusians taking their shoes off when they stand on a bench. So I wanted to ask you about uh, whether there is there are any leaders, oppositional for forces that are actually consciously organizing the strikes. I mean, I know a little bit about this, but I would love to hear your comments on you know the organization, the rules, and the sort of ongoing fervent and ongoing drive to keep gathering, you know, um, almost 80 days in a row. We also real quick have a question from uh, Ozer Tahir uh, that maybe we can dovetail in with this discussion. Um, question is to Please. what extent are these protests more orientally driven? So maybe we can kind of work on both of those at the same time. Thank Could you. you say that again, please? What was the question? Sure. To what extent are the are these protests or such protests more orientally driven? Or orientally driven? Yeah. Is that I'm sure I'm not sure to hear if that's what you meant, or maybe organically driven. I'm not sure. I'd actually, um, if you want to type, if if let me know if that's correct to hear if you type that in. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I understand the question. Is it about orientalism or the East or? what yeah, exactly I, I think that's what what he's he's asking yes okay um let me take the first question first so i i, I think in terms of the leaderlessness this is a fair point but we're, we're not exactly talking about anarchy or zuccotti park or the, the occupy movement i think there is a clear winner of the election um those who who lined up behind Tikhanovskaya were Kolesnikova and Sepkolo. And, and this is an interesting, I think, but yet fragile consensus between the liberals and the radicals in the movement. Um, because on the one hand, you have, again, the, the pushing in a kind of urban environment of a high-tech Belarus around the universities I would say um, in in favor of something that looks a little bit more Western, but without the inequality, because the, the inequality in EU East European countries, not to mention in post-Soviet countries, is not desirable for the vast majority of the Belarusian population. Um, most people, I would say, are not looking for the collapse of a welfare state to transform um, Belarus in, into, into something lacking social democracy. So when we're talking about a rule-oriented society, you know, how Belarus, the, the joke is about Austrians, that they always stop at the red light and don't want to cross the street, right? Even if there's nobody around and no traffic. I, I mean, I've, hear, I've heard this in a, in a very kind of stereotyped and essentialist way about Belarusians, that they're all like this. If they're all rule followers, you know, why are they gathering in the hundreds of thousands? Um, and, and why are they risking, in fact, their jobs? Um, many of them working at, at these factories and, and teachers, for that matter, and others, they are, they are risking um, quite a lot uh, by participating in this movement and, and putting their bodies out on the street to be beaten by the Oman. 
I, I mean, I agree on some level with, with the rule orientedness of, of Belarusian society, having been, having been there and traveled there, but protests are spontaneous. And I think that um, has continued for a remarkable amount of time. I, I did want to ask or answer some kind of factual questions if I can about the Coordination Council. So the Coordination Council is, for lack of a better word, a provisional government. You know, this is my analogy to 1917. Like, if you if you want to have a stable and lasting government, you should never call your government provisional. But it's a coordination council, and the full name is the Coordinatsiya Rada for the transfer of power. It's a peaceful transition of power. And it was announced by Tikhanovskaya after the violence, I think, was at its worst. So the first announcement came by video on August 14th, uh, in which she also said to her audience, um, announcing this, that she had won the election 60-70% of the vote on August 9th. Um, and, and so what has happened with this tra trans transitional government is they've established a seven-person presidium. The people who have been chosen for this, I think, are extremely interesting. So um, Maxim Znak, for instance, um, Kolesnikova, who was arrested, um, Sergei Dilevsky, and, and perhaps Professor Gopova could tell us more about that. Um, Dilevsky is supposed to be the spokesperson for the workers' movement. Um, all of these people have been threatened. Most of them have been exiled or imprisoned or at least harassed in one capacity or another. The Presidium was elected on August 19th. Um, Znak is um, Tsikhanovskaya's lawyer. And um, I think what, what's interesting right now is the only person, is, as far as I know, who was able to escape um, being arrested or disappeared is Svetlana Alexeyevich. Um, and, and again, I think this was, you know, thanks in many ways to the intervention of the EU. It's done other things like sanctions against the 40 people or 40 officials. But there is that famous now photograph of, of Svetlana at her apartment where people are, are knocking in the middle of the night trying to get in. And, and, she, and she called in a team of diplomats to sort of come in and, and defend her. So um, the, the threats are absolutely real. Um, she went into a sort of round-the-clock guard, um, assisted by mainly European diplomats. They were from Sweden and Romania and the Czech Republic and so on. Um, so my answer, my quick answer, I guess, to the question about um, this protest, what, what's going on, is, is a coordination council. The coordination council for a peaceful transition from a provisional government is calling on Lukashenko to resign or at least subject himself to a free and fair election. That strikes me as the most basic step here. So, you know, the Coordination Council can do all sorts of other things, and, and it has. It's introduced working groups. I, I mean, I think these are fascinating, but I, I don't think the public knows very much about what they're doing. There is um, a Christian group. There is a human rights group dealing with political prisoners, supposedly. There is a women's group. Um, this is also quite fascinating because it has to be represented by various segments of the population from age and class and background. There is a trade union group, which is interestingly called Prof Sayuz or Prof Sayuz Online, encouraging the creation of independent trade unions, I think in some ways modeled on the Polish solidarity experience from 1980 and 1981. There's an economic group, there's a business group. Who knows which oligarchs are invited to participate in this government, but certainly there will be, if Lukashenko is removed, oligarchs participating in the formation of a new Belarus. What that looks like is anybody's guess. Um, that's where I would stop. Unmute, unmute. I have to remember about unmuting myself. Um, uh, thank you, Stephen. I'm not sure whether we are ready to return to the question from the audience. Jamie, did you get a little bit of more of clarification on that question? I did. So uh, 
Ozer had sent, uh, perhaps to clarify to what extent are the violations of such quote unquote human rights more orientally driven? Okay, I, I can give a quick answer to this. I, I still, I'm not quite sure I understand it, but I, I think there are precedents for the Belarusian protest in 2020 there are easy and facile analogies that are coming from Poland and Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan and Armenia and the color revolutions. Um, certainly one can think globally here. Lukashenko is worried about becoming Gaddafi. Um, the Hong Kong protesters actually have now, since they have been protesting for 14 months, um, they have expressed solidarity with the, the Belarusian movement, and I think that includes the women's movement, or if you can call it the women's march. I'm very active on Twitter uh, because I do all of this podcasting and interviewing. I've actually followed groups like Anonymous uh, and um, the hacking community. You know, I, I mean, aside from the, the kind of official world of information through Radio Free Europe and, and others who are um, involving themselves through the Atlantic Council. I, I'm not saying that what Vyotroka is doing is not correct. It's just an endless barrage, barrage of information. There are other contexts here for 2020. And it's anonymous, which is, you know, one of these um, anarchist collectives, they've supported the Belarusian protests through and through. They've retweeted things. They've called for the, un the undermining of, of the state through, you know, these um, elections that are obviously fraudulent. Um, they've called for general strikes through September, October, and November, uh, up to and including the American election on November 3rd. Um, you know, I mean, groups like Anonymous, which are active in Chile and Bolivia, are, are even calling for the, these analogies between Belarus and the United States. Now, I mean, I'm not sure that, that Orientalism works anymore. It, it doesn't explain events as an east-west civilizational divide. Um, but certainly Lukashenko, since his election and since his arrest and jailing of opponents, um, is not a supporter of anything nearing democracy and, and a nonviolent, peaceful civil society. Uh, and and I, I think it's very easy to op oppose this violence, and it should be opposed on, on every level, but um, the popular front, for lack of a better word, it is hardly organized at this moment. Uh, we have one more question from the audience. Is that okay, Anya? Sorry. Sure, we can, yeah, absolutely, right? Okay. Or, should, or should we just wait with this question out a couple of minutes? Unless you, Jamie, think they are related to what we're talking about right now. No, maybe we'll give it a couple of minutes. Okay, so let me ask this question very fast, because Stephen, you mentioned you talked about the consequences of ongoing protests of, you know, clear dangers, uh, violence, continuous arrests. Um, but I was wondering uh, what the way the regime responded to the protesters, what, uh, what do those responses tell us about where Lukashenko is at this moment? What is his take on the situation in the country, right? Svetlana... Tsikhanovskaya declared that the, her camp is ready for dialogue with the authorities and announced the creation of a coordinating council to ensure the transfer of power. But what can we say about Lukashenko? Where does he stand? Oh, I love this question. Um, thank you. I, I think um, those of us who are observers, at least since May of 2020, have forgotten a lot of what preceded August 9th. So one of the things I, I think Lukashenko is, is about is really, I would argue, the privatization of the military force. I mean, the only people left standing behind him are the Oman and secret police and army and military and their men. Those are the masked men. I would say probably about 100,000 might be still in the payroll of Lukashenko as state violence and state authority. Um, the Siloviki are the ones who are in charge of executing the violence, not, let's say, executing people, although there have been people who have been killed. 
but the Siloviki are the ones that you see on camera covered by telegram, cover, co covered by nyekta. Um, they're armed with, with shields and clubs, and they're really unconstrained by anything. They are using flash grenades, tear gas, the, the kind of stuff that you see in 2020 in cities like Portland. Um, again, I, I mean, this is, this is an operation. But before August 9th, and really here was my point, when the opposition candidates tried to participate in a dialogue and in a political process, they still had to resort to absolutely formal and conventional ways of gathering crowds. Um, on July 30th, for example, um, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya had to, had to have a permit for a rally. Um, this was in, in the Friendship of People's Park in, in Minsk. And you know, probably there were 60 to 70,000 people who were gathered. I would say that's pretty modest if we think about Tahrir Square or Maidan or the way um, one has to say, ask the permission of authorities. And in, in asking the permission of authorities, um, this is something I think conventionally, really through the last 20 years and maybe more, um, people have resorted to this in order to protest against authoritarian regimes. Um, when on August 6th, there were 5,000 people in a peaceful protest, they took to the streets. And, and there's a significant difference between squares and streets. If, if you if you actually you know gather around a metro station, it's one thing, or a public square where you're contained and can be easily surrounded by the police and army using weapons, it's one thing. But I think part of the genius of this protest um, and in the use of new media uh, has been to kind of fan out, uh, and, and and that really is in cities, not just in Minsk, but um, especially in Hrodno and Gomel. Um, and Brest and, and, you know, Vitebsk. Um, it, it also is interesting because once you get out to the exurbs of the city, you're also in the world of the workers who are going, who are going to work at a lot of these facilities where they're risking things to take part in a strike. Um, I think scholars are also divided right now as to whether it's, it's a strike if, let's say, you gather one hour before work in front of your school or your plant and you protest, and then you go to work because you're worried about losing your job or you're worried about being fired or something like that. But anyway, to, to kind of answer the question, I think this is a different kind of protest and I'm very worried about making facile historical analogies, especially to dignity. I share Yelena's skepticism toward this as a category of analysis. Um, or, or to Ukraine, or Kyrgyzstan, or even Russia in 2011 and, and, and 2012. Um, what we're seeing is, is a different form of organization, at least at this point. So let me ask the last question, um, the one that I really cannot let go, because we know that above all, um, that this protest, protest, there's a lot of uh, women participating, right? It is about the leadership and participation of women, not only as the leaders of the protest, and you hear mentioned a number of them, including uh, Maria Koleshnikova, but also more ordinary protesters that are women. And, you know, seeing, I feel, what has been happening in Poland since Friday, I think this question sort of, for me at least personally, becomes even larger. Um, in terms of, you know, increasing women's participations in those protests, their voice being more visible and their anger becoming more visible. Um, do you mind commenting on it, on the participation of women in those protests? Stephen, you are muted. My students really hate when I do that. Um, they are so much smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, to answer the question, I, I think, I would, ar I would argue that the role of women in these protests is gonna be studied for decades. Um, 
And it should be, because not only do you have women in leadership positions, three of them, one of them, more of them, um, you, you certainly have women who are capable of leading um, protest movements until this is over. And then I, I would argue um, there are many who are participating in the Belarusian diaspora, and they should be historicized too. So just to give a couple of examples, there, I mean, there are wonderful poets out there, Valjina Mort, um, whose work I, I adore. Um, wrote poems, which are now translated in English. She's a professor at Cornell University. Her poems were translated in the New Yorker. Um, her, her work is, is just absolutely exceptional. And from a kind of humanities standpoint, it's very awkward for us as historians um, or, or let's say lit scholars or comp lit scholars to then to begin commenting on policy and political science and sociology. But Women like Valjina and Sasha Razor, who's my friend at UCLA, um, also a translator and, and someone who um, is very much involved in the Belarusian diaspora in, in Los Angeles and the other coast, they too should be historicized for their roles. Um, Pana Lyubakova is, is an exceptional journalist. I, I mean, one of the very first to um, start getting the information out and is absolutely relentless. Um, the media on Facebook, I think, is still useful. Yelena and I are part of the Facebook group Belarusky Protest with Sasha, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite accomplish everything that Telegram does or Nikta, which is, you know, um, founded by a, a poll in Warsaw and operated out of a small office in Warsaw. Um, to answer the question about the women's marches, I can pick out several details. I mean, the women's march on September 19th was extraordinarily significant. Maybe, I mean, the detentions, um, because the authorities claimed there were very few people detained and that they released people the same night. It was in the hundreds, probably it was in the thousands. Um, there was a self-molation attack right in solidarity, which actually succeeded. Um, these are things which have absolutely shocked the public in, in the way that 1968 and 1980, 81 were shocking in, um, in Prague uh, and in Gdansk. So, I mean, we can talk about this a lot more, but I think there's, there's an unseen role um, through several of the media sites like to be why um, I, I think there is certainly a role for the diaspora to play, at least in the dialogue toward a democratic Belarus. Um, and I think the traditional rallies, October 3rd was one of them, Bright Saturday, which was actually a pun on, Skit, on Skitlana's name. Um, you know, it lasted for several hours. There were white and red protesters. Um, there is the iconic Joan of Arc in this movement, who is Nina Baginskaya, who must be mentioned. She, it, she's just a woman of courage. Um, and I, I think in some ways, like you have to take sides with this. What, what she did in the photographs where she's actually up against the guards or up against the barbed wire face fence, shows her courage. This is a woman with a career as a geologist um, into the independence movement and now is, is the so-called great grandmother gendered in that particular way. She's an in, in, inspiration for hundreds of thousands of people in this and, and others who are sort of modeling their, their lives and the risks that they're taking um, in transforming themselves out of the world of spectators uh, or, or indifferent observers into people who are, who are actually taking it. Uh, so those would be my random scattered comments. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so I think before we, we, and I already am collecting some questions, as I know Jamie is too, but I was wondering whether at this point we can maybe ask Professor Elena Gapova, who grace, gracefully agreed to actually join us in this conversation, which I'm very grateful for, um, to maybe comment on what has happened. Professor Gapova is actually professor of sociology from Western Michigan University. So, uh, you know, very close place, very important place for us at UM Dearborn. 
And I was wondering whether perhaps Professor Gapova could comment on some of um, you know, the conversation happening. And, and, and may I add, Yelena, you should correct every single mistake that I've made. Oh. Um, but in dialogue with, please, we're really happy to have you. Well, uh, thank you, thank you. I'm actually speaking from my home in an app. So I'm even closer to Deborn than uh, than you, you you thought initially, Anna. Uh, so well, probably I could add some context uh, to 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 this con uh, to this conversation, uh, trying to be as historical as I am, although I'm more uh, of a social scientist. Uh, so these uh, Lukashenko was first elected uh, the president of Belarus in 1994 in those absolutely fair elections, and he won, won by a landslide. And then uh, there have been elections after that, of course, uh, and none of them was fair. But somehow it was felt and lost, well, they, they were rigged and there were protests uh, and, and they were dispersed, sometimes violently. But somehow there was this general feeling that Lukashenko had his kind of probably silent majority, but he had some support. And this, the reason might be that really uh, Belarus did not turn into this case of oligarchic capitalism. It's quite a, a welfare state. And what is, what is taking place these days is definitely not a hunger riot. It's not, a, 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 well, this kind of thing. Well, enough, it would probably would be enough to say that uh, infant mortality in Belarus at this moment is lower than in the United States. I mean, there's universal health care, uh, this very much Soviet-style uh, health care, but still it, it, it works at certain, at certain levels. There's government-supported child care and very good child care. So there's a certain, uh, a certain level of comfortable living. Uh, of course, some people are poorer, there are successful professionals, etc. Uh, so, but, well, somehow it felt that Lukashenko had some support from, from the polity, from the people. But this time it was different. And it seems that, uh, well, there was this old opposition against Lukashenko. And this old opposition, well, they were saying technically moral things. They were promoting human rights. Uh, they were standing on behalf of the national culture and, and, and language. Uh, but somehow it did not click for too many people. And suddenly this year it was different. And new people came into the game and tried to register as presidential uh, candidates. For example, Victor Babarika, a former banker, but a banker who was involved with uh, buying uh, art, his, his bank was buying art and bringing it to Belarus, art produced by the people who, were, who had been born in Belarus at the turn of the century, sometimes, well, like Mark, Mark Chagall, for example, but who after the revolution went abroad and became famous, so he was buying their paintings and bringing them to Belarus and thus created a collection uh, for, for, for the, as this national treasury. Uh, so there was uh, Victor Tsipkala, who used to be the director of the high technology park for high technology, high technology park. And there was this Sergei Tikhanovsky, who was a famous protest blogger. So these people were not related to the old opposition. And these people, they came with a somewhat different agenda. Their agenda was not about national culture. So, well, and human rights were implied, but they were speaking about other things. So I think what had happened is they were these people with whom lots of voters, the urban educated class, uh, could identify. For during the last decade or so, a new urban educated new class, whatever whatever term uh, well, I could use, uh, in, in this case, appeared, emerged. And so well, if we look at Belarusian protest rallies these days, there are all kinds of people, of course, participating. There are pensioners and students and IT specialists and creative class and even workers and, and all kinds of people. But of course, the driving force uh, of these protests has been this 
uh, urban educated uh, new class, uh, new class, new professionals. At the same time, well, uh, lots of these people are not employed in the government sector. They are included in inf global informational networks, ecological networks, feminist networks, human rights networks. Lots of creative professionals who work for, uh, for example, advertising and other kinds of creative industries. At the same time, there are people who uh, technically work in the state sector, but felt, but feel that they are somehow constrained by what the state sector is trying to impose, uh, impose on them. Well, um, recently I've been reading, I've been reading uh, an article in Novaya Gazeta, and well, that was an interview with Vladimir Postukhov, uh, a Russian political scientist who is with the London School of Economics and who said, look, this is a standoff between the regime and society. The regime meaning that, well, uh, those people who are included into the system and the people who are excluded from the, from the system, people who are included into the system, well, state sector, but not only, people who somehow are part of this Lukashenko's created system and uh, through these system, they have access to state capitalism and to economic resources through this state capitalism. And the people who also define how law is going to be practiced and implemented. And people who also produce something uh, loose, which is called state ideology. And on the other side is everyone else. So people who work in the state sector but who are not a part of this system, and people who are outside of the state, state sector, sector economically, uh, and who, of course, are not a part of this state system. And then speaking the, about the role of women, there's something that I've been saying every time I have to speak about the Lucian events, but I think this is important, and uh, making, uh, trying to make a connection with Poe's solidarity movement. I know about this from Shana Penn, uh, American historian, who wrote a book, Solidarity Secret. And the book about the role of women in solidarity, starting with the events in December 1981, when martial law was announced, and 3,500 male activists were arrested in one day, or one night, or whatever. So women remained, uh, because, of course, uh, detaining women in large numbers is very bad publicity for any government. So, and women who remained, they uh, took over and they were running solidarity movement for, for, for some time. They were doing important things in the solidarity movement, well, for some, for some time. So something similar happened in Belarus uh, when uh, Victor Babarito was arrested, Sergei Tikhanovsky was arrested. And uh, Valery Tsipkala had to leave the country, these three candidates. They were taken out of the game, and women remained. And then Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya said, well, I'm going to run instead of my husband. And then uh, Maria Kalesnikova, the head of Viktor Babarita's headquarters, and Devanika uh, Tsipkala, the wife of Valery Tsipkala, and also the head of his headquarters, they joined forces to support this one candidate, Svetlana Tikhanovsky, saying that we are all working on behalf of this one candidate. So what I'm trying to say is that men were taken out of the game, and that, that gave, gave women this, what sociologists call, the structure of opportunity was created for, for women. And of course, there are hundreds of thousands, probably millions of, of women who are not in these uh, positions to run or, or, or but just the infantry of the movement who, gave, who go on streets every day and protest and rally uh, and, and sing songs and organize all, uh, all, kinds, all kinds of things. Because, well, this is about citizenship. And the revolution, revolution seems to be about a new definition of citizenship. Citizenship is about political and legal relations between the citizens and the government. And uh, citizenship, this kind, well, liberal citizenship, it implies autonomy, voice, uh, recognition, being able to confront the government and not being punished for that. 
And this, I think, is what is going on in my native country these days. The struggle is about, and that's how the, this concept of dignity comes into place, because di dignity is about status, is about respect, is about recognition. People demand respect because we are citizens and what we are doing is, is lawful, legal, we have the right. So these Belarusian, these Belarusian events, they are about a redefinition of this relationship between the power and the citizens. So that's, yeah, that's my vision. Thank you. I really honestly hope for more time to engage in a conversation like so many important um, things were um, being said that I feel there's a lot to discuss, but we have some questions from the audience. So let me maybe start with these. Um, I know we said that we will end at one, but perhaps we can go five, ten minutes longer be, if, 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 if that's not a problem. So I will read uh, first the questions that I received. Um, how would you describe the relationship between Lukashenko and Putin? And I know that this is one of those questions many of my students, for example, are very much interested in. I don't know. I don't know who would like to take it, whether Stephen. What do, what do we know about the relationship, really? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't know if I can cover that in five minutes. Um, my quick answer would, would be to say that I think Putin is watching very carefully and biding his time right now. In some sense, this is the weird parallel universe between the Belarusian Coordination Council and Putin. Obviously, you know, because November 3rd loom, looms in the United States and, and people are wondering what's going to happen, if there will be paramilitaries called out in Michigan or if there will be a full power in the United States. But I think what, what Putin is doing right now with his, with his man, who he doesn't like particularly all that much, um, is keeping all of his options open. And, and that's the smartest that's the smartest thing to do. If a, if, a, if a coup d'etat would be lined up, let's say, by the Kremlin, I'm sure that there are some candidates that might be advanced in that. I'm not sure it would succeed. Um, and in many ways, I don't think it makes much sense because of the linkage between the Belarusian economy and the Russian economy. Um, there are plenty of people right now who I, I would put in the anti-geopolitical camp they want Belarus to be Austria or Sweden. Geographically, it's not possible for Belarus, I, I mean, I don't think, to have that. But it is absolutely possible for Belarusians to, ins to assert um, the, the salience of an election and to insist on a peaceful transition of power uh, and to reach out, as they have been doing, to the EU and to others um, to support that. So my, my quick answer about Putin, and, and Yelena, I would be interested in what you think, is that he's doing the Merkel thing where he doesn't commit to anything and it is kind of biding his time, um, doesn't particularly support Lukashenko all that much, uh, at least since 2017. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons for that. Um, is this a, a question to me? Okay. Well, uh, I don't know too much about this. And it seems, well, there have been all kinds of rumors about personal relations between Putin and Lukashenko, and, and well, rumors that actually Putin has, hates Lukashenko and etc. But it seems that, well, he doesn't want, you know, well, this, this riot this revolution that is taking place in Belarus to uh, move to the east, uh, to Russia. So it seems that he is uh, supporting the regime at the same time. Well, uh, it is believed that Lukashenko had promised to Putin that, well, he's going to go, he's going to leave. Well, there have been all kinds of discussions, but well, all that we know, we just know it from, from popular media, so. 
Yeah, I think we're guessing we're playing Kremlinologist and that's not entirely useful. Um, but certainly there, there has to be a plan in Russia for Lukashenko and, and potentially for his exile. Okay, so let me read another question. Um, with so many women leading the protest in Belarus, are there any attempts to organize younger groups of women to become more politically active in Belarus' future? I would say yes on several different levels, um, certainly around the universities, and certainly as, as Yelena has described it, if we if we are to if we're inclined to define this as a bourgeois revolution, uh, and I actually think it's more of a bourgeois revolution than a workers' revolution, you have the creative class in the cities, and I think that would certainly include the tech se sector, which is substantial and growing. Um, it would include the gig economy, if you can call it a gig economy in, in Belarus. I mean, the gig economy exists and it's not quite the precariat as it is in other places. Um, but, but certainly in terms of regime society relations, there's a future for online activists who are women and, and not only women, but to be involved, um, you know, doing something more than being information warriors that, I, I mean, I am so impressed actually by simply the amount of information. I even look at the Wikipedia page and I'm like, I'm amazed by what is transformed in just the day or, or the institute that I'm involved with in Vienna um, with the Chronicle from Belarus. They have videos now covering every week from the beginning of the protests to the end of the protests. So, I guess in terms of the citizenship idea, we are looking at, at more of a bourgeois revolution. And I think women can certainly be in, in, involved on an elite level in politics and on a sort of everyday um, scale, especially if, if they're in city environment. Um, Jamie, do we have any more questions? Because I don't see any more questions on, in my chat box. No, that's it. No more questions. Okay. So I guess we'll end here, since especially since we said it will end at one. Um, I am very grateful, Stephen and Professor Gapova, for your participation. Thank you so very much, especially uh, to Professor Gapova, who decided to join us, join us at the very, very last minute. Um, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for your participation. Uh, UM, UM Dearborn com community, please um, stay tuned for the next event in our series of, you know, historians initiating conversation about the present events. Uh, we will uh, let you know about the, uh, in the next talk very, very soon. Thank you all for, part for participating. I've recorded the entire conversation, so um, if there is any need to share it, uh, please let me know. I'll be happy to, to send it to you. Thank you.